I would consider myself as extremely wise for a 31 year old and that's because I've done and learned a lot of stuff, I've done a lot of work and I've learned a lot of stuff and I do things that most people don't do. But what I've realized is through me being at this state has come from somewhere. I came from somewhere that wanted to be this extra wise, smart person who knows everything and understands everything. And that comes from a traumatic childhood of having Tourette's growing up where I was in my head my whole life. It's beautiful, we're seeking wholeness. And we think that things outside of ourselves are gonna make us whole, right? If I get this other person, this relationship, then I'll be complete, right? It's that movie, Jerry Maguire, like you complete me. It's a total fucking lie, right? So you don't need someone outside of yourself to complete you to become whole. And the, the biggest thing, you hear this all the time, it's so cliche now, like you gotta learn to love yourself. You gotta do self care. How do I do that? Well, this breath work is how you do it. You lay down and you do this, this process and it shows you that you are whole within yourself. You don't need anything else. You don't need anything outside of yourself. And what I've seen over the last 12 years of students doing this work is, this is this is a hard thing to hear for a lot of people. It's like the only reason you ever let people treat you poorly is because you feel like you deserve it or you're not worth it. So yeah, for me, I realized it goes deeper than just simply letting go of past traumatic energy. When you've let that go, your energy has the chance to increase. The more you do that, the more your energy raises and the less bullshit you could tolerate from people around you. And then when those patterns change and people are different towards you, you notice that and that makes you feel even more empowered. All from letting go of trauma through a feeling, an energy ball and a cry. It's amazing. You're overreacting. I heard that my whole life. You're overreacting. I didn't know what that meant, but like what they meant was I, the way I was acting to that situation was way over the top, way inappropriate for what was actually happening. And because I was acting out of past trauma, past stuff. But when you do this breath work, you clear out that past trauma, you clear out that past stuff. So when the situation comes up, you will react appropriately. Like, yeah, that doesn't mean people are never going to say something shitty to you or do something shitty to you, but you are, you give it the appropriate re response. Right, so I went to a breathwork session in London a few weeks back and I did yours online. That was the first time I ever experienced te tetany or whatever it's called, where my hands are like dinosaurs. And I remember lying on the floor and I was like this for a good 20 minutes. And the person who was coaching the session came over, put a hand on my chest and held my hand whilst I was like that in midair. And I was going through this amazing experience of just bursting out with crying. And I thought, there is no way I'm going to cry. When I did it with you, I remember just being stuck and I couldn't move. And it was like, Argh! but I was bursting out with crying, proper, proper big tears that I don't yeah. even know where they came from. And I can only imagine that it's come from the energy of past traumatic experiences, even though I've intellectually gone through the process of what happened and let it go so it just shows that the energy can still be in you even though you've kind of gone through what happened and it's the most incredible way to get out this stored energy and believe it or not maybe it's because of that or maybe not I do feel completely different I feel like I've just let go of this I just surrendered even more I just am at peace with myself and it might be to do with that but either way it was the most incredible experience of my life I love it. I love to hear this. So there's a lot to unpack here. One of the things I always say, because I've heard so many of my students say it over the last 12 years, is breathwork is like 20 years of therapy without saying a word, right? And that's what people feel like when they come out of the class, like, oh my God, I just released all this stuff I've been holding on to. What we don't realize is the issues are in our tissues. It lives in our nervous system. And I say a lot of people, we're all messed up in some way, but a lot of us don't even know why. Why am I, why do I have anxiety? Why do I have depression? Why do, and science has now proven that trauma is passed on to us through the DNA. So I say, you thought you were screwed up because of your parents and you were right. It is their fault, but it's their parents' fault and their parents' fault. So what we're doing when we lay down and breathe this way, we're breathing into our sympathetic nervous system, which is where the trauma is stored. So it, that's why it, it, you release all this stuff. It's a safe environment in which to release all your stuff. Now the tetany, that's a whole other thing with the hands clamping up like that. I always say, you know, karate kid, 
throwing up gang signs, right? Like you do all this weird stuff with your hands and people don't believe me that that's going to happen, but it does. And there's a couple reasons that it happens. And when I started in breathwork 12 years ago, you know, I came from a personal trainer background and kind of a science background. And I would ask all these breathwork teachers who were really new agey and woo woo, like, why does my hands cramp up like this? And the answers I would get were like, oh, you're holding on to something and you're detoxing off weed and this and that. And I'm like, I haven't smoked weed in 20 years. Like, it's not weed, right? It's not this. And what I did was I was teaching these sold out classes and I saw commonalities of people who were doing this cramping with their hands. And they were all pushing the exhale harder than the other people who weren't cramping. So I brought in this uh, friend of mine, a student of mine, who is a health and science researcher from Harvard. And I said, here's what I'm seeing. Can you look into this and tell me what you think? And she said, yeah, when you push the exhale, you throw off more CO2. And CO2 binds to the oxygen. And in that, we need that CO2. CO2 is actually good for us in some ways. And so what I try and tell my students is, do the work on the two inhales, but on the exhale, try and relax it. No, push it. If you go really fast and you start pushing that exhale, that's going to cramp you up even more. So you can still get the big results without having to cramp up, without having to push it out. And even if you do, your hands are always going to open up again. You're always going to be fine. There are zero reported incidences of anything bad happening during this breath work. I've never had anything bad other than people freaking themselves out or getting a cramp and being, oh, that was really painful, you know? And I'm like, but did you die? You know, so uh, it's intense. It's like people aren't suspecting. They don't expect that when they come to this breath work that they're going to have this big, massive experience like this. They think it's going to be this relaxing meditation. And that's really misleading in a way. And so I took out meditation out of breath work. And I'm telling you, like, it's this intense. It's like a workout, breath work. And you have this big experience, but you release a lifetime of shit in one session. And it's totally worth it, wouldn't you say? Yeah. So, you know, obviously I will consider myself as extremely wise for a 31 year old. And that's because I've done and learned a lot of stuff. I've done a lot of work and I've learned a lot of stuff. And I do things that most people don't do. But what I've realized is through me being at this state has come from somewhere. I came from somewhere that wanted to be this extra wise, smart person who knows everything and understands everything. And that comes from a traumatic childhood of having Tourette's growing up where I was in my head my whole life. I was on medication yeah. my whole life. I had no friends my whole life. I didn't do the things that most people do my whole life. I was always different and never wanted me to be normal. So even though I've I've got there and I understand why, energetically, that childhood of why can't I just go to a party? Why can't I just have an ice cream? Why do all the teachers say do this? Why can't I just have a girlfriend? Why have I got no friends? Why are people saying I'm annoying? But then my family friends are like, you're such a great, kind person. And it's this battle of, I know I'm this, but you're telling me I'm that. And energetically, I must have put that aside. And only in my later life understood and worked out intellectually why I was different, which is because I'm different. But energetically, it seems that that pain of me being depressed every night, just wishing I could die, wishing I was different, wishing I could be normal, have a girlfriend, have friends, get a normal job. That must have, well, I know for a fact that how I used to feel, the most ha unhappiest kid on the outside. No, unhappiest kid on the inside, most happiest kid on the outside, greatest family, greatest love completely. But the inside never matched the outside. And I, I never knew that I had that much energy stored from that part of my life. And I thought, because I've done all my work, that I'm not going to cry. Everyone in that room didn't really cry. I cried and belted out the most. Now, everyone's got their own traumatic experience. When I think about my experience and what, how my experience is unique to most other people, so there's no abuse, there's no bullying, there's no, so there's no uh, physical violence, there's no death in the family. I was basically a kid with Tourette's trapped in my head. Still have met anybody with that type of story, but it would make sense how I've processed a trauma different to the average person with the usual traumatic experiences. But what that did for me was I was essentially this, I was a silent soul for a good three, four hours afterwards, where mm -hmm. I just sort of felt like nothing matters anymore. I don't care. I just feel at peace with myself. I've just got this release. I didn't even want to talk. I was just so like, 
oh, almost like I've done a huge workout and I just am drained. But what came from that is this realization of I don't need anybody other than myself. And when I'm seeking outside, come home. And now whenever I'm seeking something like I want to go on the dating apps, I want to go on Instagram, instantly come home. Whenever I want to do anything right now, it's come home. And if I still want to do it, I can. But before I never had that come home thing. But now I have. And I think it's because of that. It's beautiful. We're seeking wholeness. And we think that things outside of ourselves are going to make us whole. Right. If I get this other person, this relationship, then I'll be complete. Right. It's that movie, Jerry Maguire, like you complete me. It's a total fucking lie. Right. So you don't need someone outside of yourself to complete you to become whole. And the, the biggest thing you hear this all the time. It's so cliche now. Like you got to learn to love yourself. You got to do self-care. How do I do that? Well, this breath work is how you do it. You lay down and you do this, this process and it shows you that you are whole within yourself. You don't need anything else. You don't need anything outside of yourself. And what I've seen over the last 12 years of students doing this work is this is this is a hard thing to hear for a lot of people. It's like the only reason you ever let people treat you poorly, the only reason you ever let someone treat you like shit is because you feel like you deserve it or you're not worth it, or you're not worthy on some level. And once people start doing this breath work, they don't let people treat them poorly anymore because they go like, I deserve better. I don't need this person. And you start to become whole within yourself. And the thing that I've been saying a lot lately is work hard on yourself, but don't be hard on yourself, right? We're always beating ourselves up over stupid little mistakes. You're going to make more mistakes. I promise you that. But the shift is, do I have to beat myself up over this mistake? Do I have to be so hard on myself over this mistake? I'm going to make more mistakes. Stop being so hard on yourself about it. So the breath work has really helped me to learn to love myself, to stop beating myself up, to stop being so hard on myself, and to not, to just set appropriate boundaries with other people, right? Like say no. Like I can just say no. I don't want to do that. And I'm be okay with that. I don't have to feel bad about it. I don't have to apologize. I don't have to make up a big story. I can just say no. No is a complete sentence. And it's really powerful. And when you start to live in that power in that place, everyone around you notices. Everything changes. Your whole fucking life changes. And it's just, it's, it's amazing. And so I've watched people. First, I had the transformation. And then everyone around me was like, what are you doing? Are you medicated? What's going on? And I was like, I'm doing this weird breathing thing. I was kind of embarrassed. I'm from South Boston, you know, a tough area. Like, we don't do breath work. So I was like, I'm doing this weird breathing thing. And they're like, what is it? And I'm like, it's you breathe. And they're like, show me. So I started showing people and I watched them have these experiences. And I went, holy shit, I can change someone's life in a session, in a class. And so I started doing it all the time. And people were like, this is your gift. Like, this is what you're supposed to do. And it just so happens that everything I did in my life came together to make me really good at leading people through this thing. Right. I'm, uh, you know, you don't have to be the greatest breathwork teacher in the world. If you can just get someone to lay on the floor and breathe, they're going to have a big experience. But, you know, and I train a lot of people. I do teacher trainings where I train people to te take other people through this breathwork thing. I'm doing one in Switzerland in November, which I'm super excited for. It's my first time in Europe leading a training. I can't wait. So I teach people how to, I show them every part of it. Like you can take this person through the session. You can do a group. You can do this. And all my students come back to me and they're like, dude, this is the most incredible thing I've ever done. It's the most fulfilling and rewarding thing I've ever done. Because when you get to see someone change in front of you and you're a part of that, holy shit, do you have purpose on this planet now? And, pa you know, passion, purpose is the key. Like happiness will come and go like wind in a cloudy sky. And, but like purpose, having purpose, having fulfillment, having a reason to be on this planet, that will sustain you through the times that you're not happy. So yeah, for me, I realized it goes deeper than just simply letting go of past traumatic energy. Mm -hmm. After, when you've let that go, your energy has the chance to increase. It's almost like when you don't go to the gym for a few days after a week of heavy lifting, your muscles have time to grow. And it's that period of, wow, I can lift more. And when I translate that to how I feel on a day-to-day -day basis, I am now operating on a higher frequency. Call it a frequency of, I love myself more. I feel great about myself. So when something negative happens, or when someone says something to me, or the boss says something to me, or my friends say something shitty to me, because I'm now operating on a different frequency, I'm now no longer going to tolerate that. 
because mm -hmm. if i was on a low frequency to me that's normal it's matching my frequency i'm a cunt he's basically calling me a cunt i get it i'm a cunt now i've raised my energy to no i'm not a cunt actually i was a cunt but now i'm not a cunt now i love myself so when the boss says a cunty thing all of a sudden your energy is above their energy and there's a noticeable difference and now you what? can squash them and go no i'm not a cunt fuck off and now <laughs> the more you do that the more your energy raises and the less bullshit you could tolerate from people around you and then when those patterns change and people are different towards you you notice that and that makes you feel even more empowered and now it's just this continuous effect of I'm not going to allow you, 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 you or you to talk to me in this negative way until you just become this supercharged, powerful, positive energy. And as a result, you attract all these other people on that frequency or from letting go of trauma through a feeling, an energy ball and a cry. It's amazing. What people don't realize, you just nailed it. What people don't realize is the boss triggered you being a cunt. Right. Like he said something to you and that triggers an old memory, an old thing inside of you that makes you react. And what I didn't realize is I was out in the world reacting because of all my shit that was stored up inside of me. Like I would overreact to the situation and people like you're overreacting. I heard that my whole life. You're overreacting. I didn't know what that meant. But like what that meant was. I, the way I was acting to that situation was way over the top, way inappropriate for what was actually happening. And because I was acting out of past trauma, past stuff. But when you do this breath work, you clear out that past trauma, you clear out that past stuff. So when the situation comes up, you will react appropriately. Like, yeah, that doesn't mean people are never going to say something shitty to you or do something shitty to you, but you are, you give it the appropriate re response, you know? And I think it was either Freud or Jung that said, you know, undealt with trauma will always come forth in uglier ways. And until you heal what cut you, you will bleed on people around you who don't deserve it. And so you have to heal that old stuff. So you're acting appropriately for the situation in the world. Now, what I'll do now, like I've cleared out all that old trauma. So that stuff isn't coming up for me anymore. But occasionally new stuff will come in. So I just lay down and breathe and I clear it out like in the moment. So I'm current in my life. I'm current with my stuff. And so it just changes how you are out in the world, reacting, acting with people, in, engaging with people. And you walk around differently and it's very powerful and it's very magnetic and people are attracted to it. So obviously if you've done this for say 10 years, right? You'd think, yeah. oh, well, all the energy's out, all the trauma's out, but you just said that sometimes something comes up. So is that something that is from the present moment like last week or is it something that happened in the past that say when you were three or five or seven that you don't even know is there and then it comes to the surface great question so I, what i was saying was i've cleared out the stuff from three and five and seven so what usually what it is it's something current something recent that happened but if i don't lay down and breathe it starts to get stored again Right. So right. like, you know, I'll give you an example. When the shutdown happened, I had all this stuff hitting me all at once because I had six sold out trainings. I had a retreat in Iceland sold out. I had four classes with 500 people sold out and I had to refund everyone back. And it was this big process and it was a big nightmare. And I was getting all these nightmare emails from people. And and then I'm a football fan, American football. Tom Brady quit the Patriots. And I was like, oh, now you're going to pick. Now is the time, right? Like it was the final straw. And I just snapped. And I was screaming and yelling. And I, I went, holy fuck, I got to lay down and breathe. So I laid down and breathe. And immediately I was to the tears. So what happens to me is I don't want to feel the emotions. I don't want to feel sad. So anger is a really easy emotion for me. But anger is the mask that sadness wears. So it's easier for me to be angry. But when I get past anger and allow the sadness to come up and be felt, I'm disappointed that I, all these trainings are canceled. I'm sad that I'm not going to be able to go to Iceland. I'm sad that this and that. And I allow the sadness to be felt. And now I'm like, oh, it's all going to be okay. And you know what? I'm never going to get this time back with my children. I'm going to get to spend this time with my children. There are these young ages and I'm going to be a present dad and not traveling all over the globe and whatever. This is what's supposed to be. And I get into acceptance of what's supposed to be. And it's a game changer. It's totally a game changer. So that doesn't mean that I will never, ever be triggered from a memory from the past because something could come up that could trigger that old memory still and remind me of that. But I'm more aware of it. And if I'm taking care of myself in the proper way, if I'm laying down and breathing going, oh, that just triggered this old memory for me. And let me let that go again. 
you know, because sometimes it's it's not instant. It's not it's it's not constant. But I've released most of that stuff, and it's not. Here's a great example. You hear people out there in the world telling you a story, right? And you can see if the story is running them, as I say. They're like, oh, this happened to me. I was stabbed in the head when I was 19 and I was left for dead. And these, and the justice system, these people didn't get, they got off and it was horrible. And you can hear the story fucking running them, right? But for me now, like that story doesn't run me. I was stabbed when I was 19. It happened. It, it actually shaped who I am today. Like it doesn't run me anymore. It doesn't own me anymore. But you hear the difference in the way they're telling you the story. If the story's owning them or they're owning the story, it's powerful. <clears throat> so, for example, right, if you say you've done all the work from the childhood and something could trigger off that for a cry that you thought you'd already released, does that mean mm. that the thought can be so powerful that it can? trigger off the electrical charge or is there like an explosion and a small fragment of that explosion is like buried there and then it comes to surface and then kind of creates its own energy field i'm trying to work out is it the thought that creates that crying that you thought you'd already released or is it there's actually a small part of energy that comes out in the form of the same amount of crying and that means there's still small fragments there so you know what i mean it's a great question. I don't know the answer to it. And I'm scared yeah. of people who know everything, who say they know <laughs> everything. I think they're just making shit up sometimes. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I think, you know, it's a great thing. They, we know that our thoughts are very powerful. Like what you believe in your mind can actually create your reality, can affect your physical health. I always joke with my students. I go, you know, I have alopecia. I lost all my hair, right? And that's brought on by stress or trauma. And that happened in my 20s. And I go, if you don't think your thoughts can affect your health and go find my eyebrows because they're gone, right? And that's from my mind stressing me out and affecting my body, affecting my physical body. So your thoughts can affect your physical body and your reality in a lot of ways. So thoughts are very powerful. You have to be very careful like of how, of, you know, of what's happening in your mind. And so I don't know if it's the thought that gets triggered Sometimes I think a lot of it's unconscious too. A lot of our stuff is so unconscious. Like we're running a program from our childhood and it takes a lot of work. It takes like really consciously doing the work to stop running those old programs, those old patterns and those old thoughts in your head. Like I'm not enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not, you know, I always joke in my classes like I'm not thin enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not hairy enough. In some way I'm not enough. And the first time I ever did this breath work was the first time I ever felt like I was enough. And if you have that experience, holy shit. And then why not do that a bunch? Every time you feel like you're not enough, every time something comes up in your life that makes you feel like you're not enough, lay down and breathe and be like, oh, that was a bullshit story that somebody just said. Or, oh, that was a bullshit story that I just said in my head. And clear that out and now get to work on whatever it is you want to do and create in your life. Can you explain um, exactly how the breath triggers off the emotion, which triggers off the cry? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's tricky. It's funny. And so for some people, they'll have it in during the breath work. And some people will have it after the breath work. You know, after the, like I do a big yell at the end of my class and that releases a ton of stuff and they'll cry after that. And so, um, and but I'll joke and I'll be like, excuse me? During specifically. At the very end. So we're breathing for about 30 minutes. And at the very end of all the breath work, the active breath work technique, we let out a massive yell, two or three. It's really powerful. It's an energy release because you're building up all this energy in your system. And so some people will cry after that. Some people will cry during the breath work. And I'll joke that some people don't cry during the breath work. And they'll like ask me, I, I, why didn't I cry? Am I dead inside? Yeah, you're probably dead inside. I know. I'm joking. I'm kidding. But, you know, it, it, it's some people aren't ready to release. They're not there yet. And, you know, um, and sometimes that's the body protecting you. Like you're not ready to deal with a trauma that's it's suppressed still for a reason. You know, there's a reason why during traumas we freeze, uh, or we forget them. we completely forget them because it's too much for the mind to handle. So it'll get wiped out. It'll get blocked out. Um, I think that what we're doing when, because when you int exercise intensely, you're breathing through your mouth into your sympathetic nervous system. So why am I not crying when I exercise? Right. Although I did see this video, I, I think on Instagram or TikTok, where the guy was like, I don't know why I start crying every time I run and I get to really intensely. And I'm like, because you're getting into your mouth, 
breathing and you're breathing into your sympathetic nervous system and that's where your trauma is stored. So when we do this during breath work, we're laying down. So we're not using all that oxygen for our muscles to run or to do that intense sport. And I believe it's a safe environment when we lay down to do this, that we're, we're consciously, purposely allowing ourselves to release the trauma. We're setting that intention. Goes back to what I was just saying earlier, like your, your mind is very powerful. So if I lay down, I'm setting an intention, like, hey, I wanna release some stress, some anger, some grief. This is the best thing I've ever found for grief. Anyone out there listening that's lost somebody that's struggling with grief, grief is in the lungs in Chinese medicine. So breath work helps move it. We relive the grief over and over. We relive the loss and what this person meant to us or whatever, and so, the breath work will help move that grief through your body. It doesn't mean it's you're never going to grieve. It just means it helps get you through some of it, right? And so when we lay down and breathe this way, we're allowing that stuff to come up and come out. It, it, a, a bunny, if a bunny gets chased by a fox or whatever, and it gets away, it doesn't get killed, it shakes. These animals, the animals will shake. That That's their mechanism by which to release the trauma. So I believe that this is, this is our mechanism by which to release the trauma. See, when I did it, I wasn't thinking about anything specifically. Things yeah, came into my mind at the end, which was I seeked a girlfriend since I was like 13. And basically what that means is I wanted somebody to see me for who I was. And I thought I needed them to approve and love me. But actually it was just me accepting myself. But during the like 20, the half an hour, 45 minutes, I was just simply doing the breath work and I just lost myself. All of a sudden, you're kind of just the coach is like and hold. And I'm like, where the fuck have I just been for the past five minutes? And then you're holding. And that's the process happening. But I want to try to understand if I if I wasn't thinking about something, then something must be happening to my body simply through giving it enough oxygen that does something maybe it's to the sympathetic nervous system which when mm. once that is activated and most of the time we're in the parathetic nervous system that as a result that stimulates this overwhelming emotion so do you reckon it's to do with activating the sympathetic nervous system which most of us aren't in all the time and that's what stimulates this crying yes i do for is the short answer and you said something i want to touch on because I'm seeing a lot of breathwork coaches do this out there now, and it's kind of, it's a little bit unsafe where there's two techniques. There's the, the active um, circular breathwork, right? Which is two breaths in, one breath out through the mouth, right? Then there's breath holds, right? Those are two separate techniques, not meant to be combined together. But I'm seeing coaches now do this where they combine the circular breathwork with the breath hold. And that's not a safe move because when I do breath holds, like a Wim Hof technique, 30 yes. breaths in and out and I hold, you, my mind starts to go, okay, John Paul, it's been 40 seconds, take a breath. Oh, John Paul, it's been a minute, it's been two minutes, take a breath, right? It's telling you, come on, take a breath. But when I do active breath work, circular breath work for 30 minutes, my brain does not send that message to take a breath. So people can hold their breath until the point of a, a, a seizure or passing out. So it's dangerous to combine circular breath work with breath holds. And I have a whole YouTube video on this if anyone wants to go deeper. But I'm seeing teachers out there doing that. And I'm like, who the fuck's telling you to do this? Nobody said to combine these. You don't just combine two techniques willy-nilly without knowing what the outcome of that can be. So there's a lot of people doing breath work and it's a little bit of a Wild West scenario right now. And there some people are doing great jobs, um, but other people are just combining things and like you never want to do it near water or on water because of the tetany, right? You can cramp up and you could roll over into the pool. And I saw someone doing it on paddle boards and I'm like, what the hell are you doing? If somebody gets tetany and rolls off the paddle, and they're like, it's only two feet. I'm like, it doesn't matter if they're cramped up, they could drown in that two feet of water. So um, there's a lot of people out there doing this that need better qualifications that need to do like a training with somebody who knows what the hell they're doing. And I'm seeing people lead trainings who don't have the time in, you know, doing the work now. Like everybody wants to just jump ahead and be the teacher doing the trainings now. And I'm going, oh my God, you don't even have the time. You haven't even put the work in to know enough to lead a training. So um, I'm sorry, I got off topic about your question because I'm very passionate about this. And 
Yeah, I don't think there was a question. I think I was just um, explaining or trying to find a justification for where the crying comes from. And it's just simply most of us are never really in the sympathetic nervous system long enough to experience what it should be like, which is that pure joy, almost like when someone's getting married. You're just overwhelmed with joy. And that's because you could say you're so present, you're so happy, you're so in love, you're so in the moment, you're so on a high vibration. But most of the time, we're just angry and depressed. So we never really feel those happy tears. We're normally feeling angry tears. Um, do you yeah. think... Oh. Well, a lot of people are blocked off. And they. what's happened to a lot of people is they want to feel happy, they want to feel joy, but they don't want to feel sad right? They don't want to feel the tears. They don't want to feel the anger. And it doesn't work that way. You cannot close your heart off to the anger and the sadness and allow it be open to the happiness and the joy. It doesn't work that way. So what I've done is I've decided to live with an open heart. And what does that mean? It means I'm going to allow the joy. I'm going to allow the gratitude, but I also have to allow the sadness and the anger. People get surprised when I get pissed off or I get this or whatever. I'm like, no, I'm living with an open heart. And sometimes we live in a fucked up world and people do shitty things and it makes me mad or it makes me upset. And I'm allowing that emotion to be expressed appropriately. Sometimes anger is the appropriate emotion. Sometimes sadness is the appropriate emotion. So I'm allowing all of it. It's very interesting. What came to me was when I had my awakening at 21 and I'd felt like I understood why people were like that they were and I always forgave them instantly, whatever they did. I felt it was my responsibility from knowing this knowledge, which is negative energy is toxic and poisonous to people. That if somebody was doing a shitty thing to me, I would just sort of go inside. OK, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. But secretly, I'd be boiling and boiling and boiling and boiling. Yeah. So actually, I realized Yes, I'm doing a good human thing to kind of tolerate your bullshit. But I have a, a uh, I have like a spectrum of how much bullshit I can tolerate before you feel the force of that energy building up. So actually, I realized rather than getting it to the edge, as soon as somebody, let's just say, is trying to control you in a certain way through words or action, just put your hand on their shoulder and say, thank, thank you very much for doing that, but please don't tell me what to do. Is that okay? Nip it in the bud in a non-passive aggressive way or basically a psychology way where you're smiling, holding their hand, but the words are powerful. Like, I'd appreciate if you don't tell me what to do. Is that okay? Big smile. Their brain's hearing the words, but I've got a big smile on their face. So there's no defensiveness because it doesn't match what they're hearing. So they're like a bit confused, but they've got the message. And I learned that's all you need to do. Otherwise, if you take me to level 10, you'll hear the, so fucking me telling me what to do, you stupid prick. And that's not necessary because I just had to, that came from the energy. It's not yeah. me. It came from the negative charge. And that charge came from me not releasing this steps of anger of what that person was making me feel like. So as you say, yeah. it's okay to release the anger if somebody is triggering you. What's not okay is purposely going out and being a prick to everybody because something will happen when you were four years old. <laughs> totally. You're spot on. And that's just, you're setting appropriate boundaries. Like this is a boundary. And I can say no to something or hey, or let people know that that's not okay with me without getting all worked up and not, without like making them wrong or telling them why they're wrong. And, you know, and just saying it from a calm, even place of like, hey, I'm sorry. Um, I don't need you to tell me what to do. I, I've got this. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. You can say it in a way that they're heard, they're felt. You, you, you're you acknowledging them. You're acknowledging what they said. And you're still saying no. Right? I had this coach years ago and he had these three words. It's like, I hear, I see, I feel like, you know, you're acknowledging them back. What you're saying, what you're doing, whatever. And I still think this is the best route for me. And I'm still going to do this, you know? And he would get like these incredible car salesmen up there and they would like try and sell him a car. And he'd be like, I hear what you're saying about the Porsche. And I still feel like the station wagon is the best choice for me. And then the car salesman would come at them again. And after like three or four times of him saying, I hear, I understand, I feel what you're saying. They couldn't say anything else. They were done. It just diffused them calmly. It was oh. fucking amazing. And just to watch that in the thing and also learning people's communication styles was a thing that I learned from that too. It's like some people 
you know, they feel right. And some they're, they're, they're feeling they're kinesthetic. Some people are auditory and some people are visual and it's in their language. It's in their email, right? I hear what you're saying and what it sounds like to me, that's auditory, right? I, I, I see what you're saying and what it looks like to me, that's visual. So when you start to learn people's communication style, they're like, oh my God, this guy totally gets me. If you can communicate it back to them in a way, but that's a whole other thing we're tapping into there. But you know, it's just about being comfortable in your own skin, which is one of the biggest uh, things that I've gotten out of the breath work. It's like, I'm comfortable in my skin enough where I can go, hey, you know, thanks, I appreciate that. And I don't think I'm gonna do that. That's not for me. Um, and I can just say no, or just tell people that, yeah, it's not, it's not a good fit or whatever and not have to get upset about it. And it's not about me most of the time, even when people are coming directly at me with their shit and saying things about me, it's not about me, that's about them. What you say about me says more about you than it does about me. It was a weird phenomenon that happened during the shutdown where people were so angry. I think because everyone's fucking plans got canceled and the whole world got shut down and they're like, man, this sucks, like what now? And people were coming at me on social media in ways that I had never experienced before. And like just anger and vitriol and all this stuff. And my reaction at first was like, fuck you. Like, I don't know, like just because I'm a breathwork teacher doesn't mean I'm not going to tell you to fuck off. Like yeah. that's not who I am, right? Don't cross the line with me. And then it was just like, this is about you. Like I just started putting that quote up there. It's like, whatever you say is more about you than it is about me. Like it's not on me. You can say whatever you want. Uh, and, and so it was a lesson for me because social media can be pretty vicious. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm a very sensitive person. That was kind of my weakness growing up in a tough area. Like I was ultra sensitive in a really tough area. And it's funny because now that's kind of become my superpower. When I teach my breath work, I allow myself to be sensitive. I allow that to flow through me and people will hear me getting emotional in the class and that allows them to get emotional. That gives them permission. So your greatest wound can come, become your greatest strength if you allow it, if you can find that journey. Yeah, it's interesting because years ago when I was a child, if somebody says something negative about me, I feel like the whole world is going to destroy me. But now if I see something online, for example, they're saying, oh, why are you winking? You're on drugs or you're clearly on crack or why are you twitch or whatever. I don't have this energy charge. They're, they're not talking about me, even though it's me. My physical is separate to my spiritual. So when I read it, it doesn't bother me, like truly doesn't bother me. They're literally just venting their own anger and frustration in a way where what they believe doesn't match up with that. You're saying something, but yet you're winking. What that means is, is that they need people to validate what, you know, their belief system externally without it just being, you know, it's, it's got to make sense to them in other ways. And um, that, you know, that's when I truly negative energy is always about the other person and there's one thing knowing that but feeling it or should i say not feeling it does take work it takes it takes work you've got to get your own negative energy out of you in order for it to to not trigger because it will trigger if it's not completely out yeah i agree and, and you know it's always about their own stuff like they're they're projecting their own stuff onto you i i, I would put something up and then someone would say something i'm like that completely doesn't match with what i just said and did like where how did they get that out of what just happened it's so strange and it's like they're coming at it with their own stuff and when you're comfortable in your own skin and you're out there putting yourself out there in the world it bothers some people because they want to do it but they can't and you, you know what I mean? You'll never be, you'll never be criticized by someone doing more than you, you know, like all these great people, Tony Robbins or whoever you like, they're not online criticizing other people. He's busy doing it. He's so busy helping people and doing his own thing. He doesn't have time to go online and criticize other people. So you're always criticized by someone who's jealous doing less. And that once I got that realization, I was like, oh yeah, there, you know, no one great out there is criticizing what I'm doing. Right. Anything you want to promote or plug before we end it? Um, I do my class on Zoom every Sunday and um, it's 9 a.m. California time, but there's a replay for the class. It's usually 72 hours. 
uh, unless I'm doing a training and then it's 10 days. So like last Sunday's class, there's a 10 day replay. So somebody could go and do that now. So I do this live Zoom class and people come from the UK. They come from all over the world to do this class. It's amazing. Um, and they, a lot of people will sign up just do the replay because they're in different time zones, right? Um, and then I'm doing a training in Switzerland in November. So that's going to be amazing. So if somebody wants to come and learn how to become a breathwork teacher, how to have this incredibly fulfilling, purposeful career as a breathwork teacher, come to that training. And then I also have the trainings online if you can't make it to the training in Switzerland. So you can do the training and get certified through me online. And all of this stuff is on my website, which is breathewithjp.com, B-R-E-A-T-H-E. There's an E on the end of breathe, withjp.com. You'll find all the links to all that stuff on that website. And I hope to see some people in my classes trying the breath work. It's an incredible experience. And if you want to level up in your life, if you want to change something in your life, you have to do something different. You know, nothing's going to change if you don't do something different. And finally, if you'd one day left to live, what is the last thing you would tell everybody before you go off? Mm. I'm getting choked up. I didn't realize. Um, I would say that, you know, stop being hard on yourself. Work hard on yourself, stop being hard on yourself and just learn to love yourself. And at the end of the day, that's all that's going to be left is those, the love in your heart, you know? And so just focus on that, focus on the love, focus on the gratitude and what really matters in your life. All right. Thank you very much, John. Thanks, Oliver. It was great, great seeing you. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, please remember to subscribe, turn the bell notifications on, like the episode and comment below. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's yes, King Oliver. Take a look at the other videos to your side. And if you just want to listen to this podcast, you can do so on Apple and Spotify and most other platforms by going to talkwitholiver.com. <laughs>